All right, welcome to Young Turks. Cenk, you are David Schuster with you guys today. Uh, we've got uh, an amazing show for you all. Uh, tragic news out of the submarine. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, people throwing phones, people throwing punches. Uh, are Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg are actually going to physically fight? That fascinating. That story is coming up later in the program. All right, we've got a lot more where that came from. David, take it away. John, yesterday we brought everybody the story of Marjorie Taylor Greene on the House floor calling Lauren Boebert a little bitch. Well, one day later, <laughs> we've learned a little bit more about their confrontation. Uh, so let's go through this with a little bit of context now that we've been able to develop. In case you missed yesterday's story, here's what this very silly spat between the two MAGA Republicans was all about. Greene introduced impeachment articles against Biden as early as January 2021. And then again, this May, Boebert put forward her own impeachment articles more recently but has been trying to force an immediate vote on them by turning them into a so-called privilege resolution that can go straight to the floor. This is according to some before. Well, Marjorie Taylor Greene was very unhappy that Lauren Boebert was essentially trying to undercut or one up Marjorie Taylor Greene. And earlier in the day, Greene said she has been a long champion of articles of impeachment against Biden and strongly suggested Lauren Boebert is late to a push that she herself, Greene, already owns. Lauren Boebert never addressed the conference. I made it clear to the conference that I have introduced articles of impeachment literally since Joe Biden's first day in office. I have been talking about it with everybody forever, literally everyone forever. If I'm blue in the face, you see me? I'm blue in the face as if it's a good thing to deprive your brain of oxygen and <laughs> become blue in the face. Well, the big fight then happened later in the day. And here's what happened. They were both on the House floor. The back and forth apparently began when Lauren Boebert approached Green, who was then seated in the chamber and confronted Green over her statements you made about me publicly. Green then stood up and alleged that Boebert copied my articles of impeachment to which the Colorado lawmaker fired back that she has not even read Green's resolution. Green. I've donated to you, I've defended you, but you've been nothing but a little bitch to me. And you copied my articles of impeachment after I asked you to co-sponsor them. Bobert, okay, Marjorie, we're through. Green, we were never together. Now, it's not exactly clear what happened, but at some point during the fight, this came. Green said that at one point, Bobert accused Green, the Georgia lawmaker, of accidentally spitting on her lip. Then towards the end of the exchange, Boebert tried to re-engage Green, but Green cut the conversation off. I said, you need to shut up because the only person that's recognized to speak right now is Luna. Green told Semaphore, referring to Representative Anna Paulina Luna, Republican from Florida, who was then giving a speech on the floor. So a little more context, I'm not sure it gets any prettier, Jenk, but your reaction. Yeah, okay, these are children, uh, and let me explain what would happen if adults uh, were involved in this conversation. So let's say that I was in, the, in Congress and I'd introduced a resolution on paid family leave. Uh, and then uh, later someone else introduced a resolution on paid family leave, and it looked like it had momentum and might pass. That wouldn't make me mad, that would make me happy, because I want paid family leave. But for them, it's not about the policies. And this is nonsense anyway, it's impeachment of Biden over literally nothing. So Marjorie Taylor Greene's point is, I was a fraud well before you were a fraud. And Boebert's like, oh yeah, I'm trying to steal your thunder on how big a fraud I am. So they don't, there's nothing to care about. There's no policy, none of this is gonna help the average American's life at all. And, and it's all about egos. And that's why they're fighting, that's why they hate each other now, even though Ostensibly, they agree on policy, although I haven't really seen them talk about policy ever, ever, ever to help the average American. No, maybe to hurt people like, oh, I hate trans people, I hate gay people, I hate black people, whatever it is. Oh, January 6th, when we try to do a coup against America it was awesome. Instead of a policy, policy, something that actually helps the average American, none, nothing. So, and uh, to be fair, look, there's these kind of like, there's fights between Democrats and Republicans that are very similar to this. So Democrats are not completely innocent of this either overall. Now in this particular fight, it's only these two, right? And so I'm being clear about it, but look, on the Democratic side, the main problem is they don't have enough fights because they actually disagree on policy. So the progressives want paid family leave, the great majority of the Democratic Party are corporate Democrats who don't want it. And so the progressives should challenge them on actual 
policy. But none of that works here in Washington. It's a bunch of children. They're aided and abetted by the mainstream press that loves this kind of stuff. And so, and by the way, okay, here, I'll adjudicate this nonsense fight. Who's correct? Yes, Marjorie Taylor Greene is more correct in Washington world. She introduced the resolution first, and you're supposed to give deference out of the etiquette, blah, 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 blah. Okay, who's actually correct if you cared about Biden being impeached, which is, as I stated earlier, absurd anyway. But Bobert is correct, because Bobert had introduced it in a way that would force a vote right away. Now, the reason that Marjorie Taylor Greene did not do that is because she's working with Kevin McCarthy, and Kevin McCarthy does not want it introduced right away, as he showed by basically kicking it over to a committee that David will probably tell us about in a second. And so Marjorie Taylor Greene was being a good soldier by not pushing it forward. And when Lauren Boebert did push it forward, then she caught feelings like, that should be my credit. I should get the credit for being dumber than you. Okay, well, all right, have at it, Hoss. <laughs> well, and we've also found out that Marjorie Taylor Greene has apparently a certain affinity for the word bitch because she's now used it repeatedly, and we'll explain that in just a sec. But first of all, both uh, congresswomen spoke to the media after their little spectacle on the House floor. And by the way, this is the same House floor where Marjorie Taylor Greene served as parliamentarian a few weeks ago and called for decorum. Anyway, this is what uh, Greene told the Daily Beast. I'm sorry, Lauren Boebert told, told, told the Daily Beast, Marjorie is not my enemy. I came here to protect our children and their posterity. Joe Biden and the Democrats are destroying our country. My priorities are to correct their bad policies and save America. Here's what Green told the Daily Beast, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Green also spoke to Semaphore about the showdown. Green said that she told Boebert she was upset that the Colorado lawmaker had decided to imitate rather than support Green's own impeachment effort. It's purely for fundraising, said Green. It's throwing out red meat so that people will donate to her and Lauren Boebert's campaign because she's coming up on the end of the month and she's trying to produce good fundraising numbers. Asked whether there was any chance the two would reconcile after the confrontation, Green said absolutely not. She has genuinely been a nasty little bitch to me. Yes, she used the word bitch again. Well, that night, Lauren Boebert, the Colorado Republican, then claimed that she needed she needed to impeach Joe Biden because it was a holy mission. Watch. All glory to God. Uh, this is uh, this is grace. This is God's empowerment, His ability, and staying grounded, rooted in the Word of God. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And um, I, I am I am directed and led by Him. You know, there was pressure for me not to introduce the articles of impeachment tonight. Well, not introduce them, but bring them up and call them for a vote. And um, I said, you know, I, I have a um, a peace, a still in my spirit, and I'm going to be led by peace. Um, um, not by the pressure from the outside. Um, and, and we've seen that on full display with the speaker's race where Matt Gates and I were surrounded, um, pressure from the outside, but strong on the inside, knowing that we are purposed um, and, uh, and that we are doing what is right, what is righteous. It is all about being led by the spirit of God in everything that you do. I do give him all glory for where I am, for the people that he has positioned me with and in front of um, to speak life into situations and to hold um, the corrupt accountable. So Lauren Boebert was on a mission from God to impeach Joe Biden. You may recall the Blues Brothers were on a mission for God, from God, but for them it was to raise money for a Catholic church. For Lauren Boebert, it's to impeach Joe Biden. In any case, unfortunately for Boebert, Jenk, as you mentioned, Kevin McCarthy put the big kibosh on her mission. House Republicans are now aiming to refer a Biden impeachment resolution to two committees instead of holding an immediate vote on impeaching the president. The House will vote Thursday to send a resolution offered by Representative Lauren Boebert, Colorado, to the Homeland Security and Judiciary Committees. This is from NBC News. The House Rules Committee advanced the plan in a last meeting, last minute meeting Wednesday night after huddling with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who urged rank and file Republicans at a closed door meeting earlier in the day to oppose Boebert's resolution, arguing that such an important issue should go through the committee process. Three GOP sources who heard the comments confirmed. There were also several Republicans close to McCarthy who spoke on the record to the media blasting impeachment, regardless of whether it's from Marjorie Taylor Greene or from Lauren Boebert, saying that it is misguided, it is premature, it undercuts their existing Joe Biden investigations. And so interestingly, Jenk, Republicans at least seem to understand the political problems here, and that is they understand that they're giving Democrats a huge political gift by portraying the GOP yet again as reckless and not serious. 
Yeah. So, all right, look, at least one person says something honest in this exchange. And and that was funny enough, Marjorie Taylor Greene. She said that Boebert's doing it for fundraising. That is definitely true. And she would know because Marjorie Taylor Greene introduced that resolution earlier for fundraising. And all of this, all of this theater is for fundraising. So look, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, and a lot of the radical right have figured out uh, something accidentally. When AOC and others ran as uncorrupted Democrats with no corporate PAC money, they actually had to try to appeal to the grassroots to get money. And so they had to do things that were popular on their side. And the right wing learned from that. So Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert now do inflammatory things that are popular on their side. But on their side, you have to be a lunatic to be popular. So you have to say, like for example, on this Articles of Impeachment, Anybody who watches the show knows I massively disagree with Joe Biden on a ton of things. But impeachment, what are we impeaching him for? And the Republicans are like, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Something we disagree with him on policy, the border. Yeah, that's it. You can't impeach someone because you disagree with them on policy. I think Joe Biden was a fraud on minimum wage. He said that he was going to raise minimum wage. He didn't even try. He torpedoed it on his own. He's a giant liar and a greasy politician. So are all of them. You don't impeach someone over that. You impeach someone over something that they did wrong legally, not because you disagree. But it's they don't care about any policy. They don't care about anything related to the actual voters. This is all for fundraising, ego, etc. And then what is that God gobbledygook? You know, you right wingers, you 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 both kill me and amuse me. I mean, like, what are you guys doing? Like, you listen to that crap and you believe that? All she has to say is like, uh, God spoke to me and God agrees with my impeachment proceedings, so uh, God made me do it, uh, so it must be right. Wait a minute, can I just say the same thing? Okay, God says that uh, that he's in favor of paid family leave. Go pass it now. No, it's not me. It's not me. It's God. Well, now you got to do it. Now you got to do it. And uh, you know, I'll use the same gobbledygook. Like, there's a what did she say? I'm gonna put life into it, and there's a split somewhere, and there's a log in somebody else's eye, and Gog and Magog want something else. Whatever. Let's pass some goddamn real bills instead of this crap. All right. And lastly, in terms of um, going to committee, what that means is they delayed it because they don't want to do it. Okay, so the leadership of the Republicans, why don't they want to do it? When they all would fundraise off of it, their base is frothing at the mouth and like, ah, they wanted to. Marjorie Taylor, Taylor Greene is blue in the face, as David explained to you earlier, because from the minute she got in, let's impeach Biden. But wait, he hadn't done anything yet because they don't care about reality, right? But Republican leadership realizes we're all starting to. Sound and look like lunatics before, and then David, this is really important because before they had a nice little shell game that mainstream media would help them with. Oh, well, the Republicans are just as good. I mean, I can't tell 50 50. They could be right, the Democrats could be right. Maybe the rich deserve another couple of trillion dollars in tax cuts. I can't tell. It's 50 50. Now it doesn't look 50 50 anymore because they look like goddamn lunatics. So now they're not going to lose their base over that. Their base loves it. They fraud more, right? No, they're going to lose important swing districts and maybe swing states. That's why they're worried, not because they want to do the right thing. It's the Republican Party. That would never happen. I think they may also, Jack, end up losing supporters of, say, border and custom control workers and agents. Because one of the things that, you know, one of the Democrats read the articles of impeachment in one of the hearings already. And literally, you have Lauren Boebert's resolution, which says Joe Biden has given the border to total anarchy to the cartels. Now, you can make an argument that maybe the cartels have more power over the border, maybe they have more influence, but to suggest that they totally control the border is ridiculous. Likewise, to suggest that it's Joe Biden has turned into an open border to invite everybody in. Well, again, that you know that's maybe a great rhetorical flourish if you're a conservative, but that's not grounded based in reality. And it's again, it's the difference between you want to argue over the policy, then let's have a serious argument over whether there should be more border security, whether it should be tighter, whether there should be more efforts to take on the cartel. But to just make up a bunch of baloney, which is absolute nonsense, which is insulting to the border states and also to the border agents who are down there, it doesn't seem like that serves any real 
benefit to the Republicans and only seems to hurt them at least politically in some of the Southwest states. So I don't mean to offend third graders here, but I, I, I'm, I'm done trying to argue with Republicans. It's like arguing with a third grader. Like, oh, what do you think? Oh, you think the policy should be different because Sally wore the wrong bow. Okay, good one. Let me think about it. Look, every Republican politician is a liar. Every single one of them. Because they all say, as an example, but I can give you hundreds of examples. Oh, we have an open border. No, we don't. That's a lie. There's like, if there, we had an open border and nobody was guarding it and it was perfectly legal to come in, a hell of a lot more people would come in. No, there's laws against it. And that's why we detain people when they come across the border. And in fact, they say we're not detaining enough people. Oh, wait, so that means we are detaining people. That means it's not an open border. And every one of you is a goddamn liar. So what am I debating? I'm not debating these clowns. And the mainstream media, unfortunately, again, they aid and abet this by having debates over matters of fact that can't be debated. <laughs> right? So how do I debate your non-facts with my facts? It, it makes no sense at all. And, that, and the only way you debate it is you wind up being Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert debating each other about who's dumber, and who's the bigger bitch and weirdo stuff like that. So welcome to America. This is what our government has turned into. And one more bite at this apple, and that is there seems to be a sense, Jenk, among a lot of um, the rank and file Republicans based on some of the reports and social media that this is not the end of the Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert fight, that this is really just the beginning, that it's gonna get more intense, it's gonna get harsher. They will start dragging in their various allies and supporters. And so you really are perhaps looking at a circular firing squad, at least in the MAGA caucus, over who should get credit for trying to impeach Joe Biden for something so absurd. Uh, so, you know, if you're a Democrat, I think you sit back and you open up the popcorn and, and you enjoy it because you are literally starting to watch the Republicans disintegrate and tear themselves apart before our eyes. Yeah, David, last thing on that. This is a good point. There is a silver lining there, which is that normally the Republicans shred the Democrats. They lie about them, they rip their face off, and the Democrats are like, oh, please don't, you're being offensive, and they never fight back. Now, at least they're being vicious to each other. Good, Republican politicians rip each other apart, and, and at least you're you know, taking each other out instead of uh, innocent people uh, along the way. So have at it, Hoss, uh, we'll sit here with the popcorn and enjoy. <laughs> Love it, I think we're going to a break, right, Jake? Yep, uh, so we gotta take the break. And now when we come back, uh, oh, one of the things that's happening is um, they decided to go after Adam Schiff. I mean, you want to talk about nonsense. Again, Adam Schiff can't stand him. Now you're gonna force me to defend him. It's just one party in this country is totally incompetent and the other one is filled with lunatics. Uh, so yay America, we'll be back. All right, back on TYT, Jenk and David with you guys. Also, Mario Mancilla. Mario just joined by hitting the join button below the video on YouTube, thereby becoming an American hero and helping to do uh, us to do honest reporting and is part of the team now. And you all can do uh, likewise at tyt.com slash join. And our prices are still super low, even though we did have inflation, we did not raise them at all. And I'm gonna read one comment from YouTube member because I like it, HC wrote in. Imagine if Ilhan Omar said she's doing something for Allah. That's an excellent point. Everybody's heads would explode. But when Lauren Boebert she says she's doing it for God, everybody's like, oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, I love having a smart audience. I love it. Okay, David, what's next? Jank, let's hope that our audience, our viewers on this day, if they are watching us or listening to us from Texas, let's all hope that they have a good working air conditioning system that is strong and consistent because the state is in the midst of a nasty heat wave. Here's a headline from Axios, Texas steam bath continues with record breaking heat. 
Axios writes, with heat indices reaching upwards of 120 degrees Fahrenheit across parts of the Lone Star State, the high temperatures are endangering lives. It is forecast to continue into the weekend and may even intensify next week. A heat wave in Texas and surrounding states has prompted the National Weather Service to issue heat warnings and advisories for more than 40 million people at a time. Of note, the affected areas in the south central states in Mexico are in line with global developments. Deadly extreme heat has scorched parts of India and China, and the North Atlantic Ocean continues to break sea surface temperature records with alerts issued for marine heat waves that can damage coral reefs. Axios continues, context, climate change is increasing the severity, frequency and likelihood of extreme heat events in the United States and worldwide, numerous studies show. Climate Central's climate shift index recently showed the high temperatures forecast during the ongoing heat wave are at least five times more likely to occur now due to increased amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere compared to the pre-industrial area era. And that is just the impact, by the way, of course, on the ground and in the sea. Uh, the airline industry is now acknowledging that climate change is increasing our risk of this. Watch. One of the most extreme cases of turbulence caught on camera. A flight attendant picking up empty beverage cups slammed to the ceiling of the 737. The suddenness and strength of the turbulence highlighted by how much is thrown to that ceiling, including the beverage cart, as the jet drops significantly. The cart crashing onto passengers, some scalded by hot water, according to those on the Bulgarian jetliner from Kosovo to Switzerland. Ten passengers transported to the hospital. This incident was from a few years ago. It involves something known as clear air turbulence. And that is turbulence that forms in essentially a cloudless sky. It's essentially by surprise. In other words, there are sudden wind shears that form that catch pilots and aircraft at a time when maybe they're not expecting it. And these wind shears are caused by changes in the jet stream. Those are those invisible rivers of air that go through our atmosphere. Well, when those jet streams change and they curve or they bend, that causes these very strong wind shears. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, these wind shears create these pockets of clear air turbulence. Well, severe clear air turbulence, and this is as The Verge reported, severe clear air turbulence has already become more common according to a study published in the journal Geophysical Research Letters last week. On a typical flight route over the North Atlantic, there was a 55% increase in clear air turbulence between 1979 and 2020. While the increase in turbulence was the most pronounced over the United States and North Atlantic, the study also found significantly more turbulence along popular routes over Europe, the Middle East, and South Atlantic and Eastern Pacific. Turbulence already costs the airlines hundreds of millions of dollars each year in terms of damage and repairs and flight delays. Uh, and unlike turbulence that is say associated with thunderstorms where an aircraft radar can pick up the water droplets and essentially guide pilots around it. Again, with clear air turbulence, it is essentially invisible to pilots and all of their equipment. The only good news, the only good news in this is that pilots say that if you are in clear air turbulence, it doesn't have to last very long as long as you ascend or descend a few thousand feet out of this wind shear pocket. So at least the pilots, they know how to deal with it. But for everybody who's back in the cabin has already been jostled because the pilot said you were free to walk around the cabin and you were technically not guaranteed of a free eventless, eventless sort of walk to the bathroom. Well, you can thank climate change. Yeah, so uh, first of all, on the issue of the planes, I remember, you know, always thinking, what are we putting the seatbelt on for? Who are we kidding? Uh, this is all just psychological, because if this plane crashes, I got news for you, the seatbelt ain't gonna help, right? But then I heard the story of Don King a while back, uh, and apparently, and it, look, I heard it from a friend, so just warning, I didn't get it from an article, etc. So buyer beware. Uh, but that this happened to Don King, that they had turbulence, he didn't have a seatbelt on. Boom, and he goes and he hits his head on the top of the uh, the ceiling of the plane, and that he got really injured, right? And so, kind of like you saw in that video. Now, if you're thinking, well, look at that, that happened a while back, to, and so turbulence happens from time to time. No, that's the whole point. We had heat in Texas before, of course, right? We've had extreme weather events before. We've had turbulence before, but now there's a lot more of it. And it's more extreme. And guys, this is another one where we're having nonsense debates. Who are we debating? We're debating the oil companies. The oil companies are the ones that bought off 100% of the Republican Party. And let's be honest, a giant portion of the Democratic Party. There's no 
actual facts that we're debating, all the scientists agree. It's not complicated, the temperature readings are higher, the oceans are warmer, the ice caps are melting. Everything is far more extreme than it has been before. We've shown you all the graphs. So what's the debate about? There's no debate, this is definitely happening. And when it's not gonna happen later, it's happening now. It's happening now, right? And yet, nobody's doing anything about it. And meanwhile, the so-called Democratic President, Joe Biden, is doing fossil fuel pipeline after fossil fuel pipeline, Willow Project, Mountain Valley Pipeline, pretended that he was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do Green New Deal, Oh yeah, I'm FDR 2.0. No, he serves his donors just like the Republicans do. And so we're all on that plane that you saw together. And we're all gonna bang our heads and we're all gonna be in massive, and we are, we already are in massive trouble. But yet we can't get the idiot corrupt politicians and the idiot corrupt media to pay attention and say things that are true. The media looks out and goes, oh, I don't know, 99% of the world scientists versus a Republican politician paid millions of dollars by the oil companies. I can't tell, I'll call it 50-50. Jenk, for the, for the nerds, for the fellow nerds out there who want to know a little bit more about the science, uh, particularly with a clear turbulence. So what happens is these greenhouse gases, they get pumped into the troposphere. That is sort of the lowest level of the atmosphere. Uh, some of the mountains stick into the troposphere. We have aircraft that fly in the troposphere. Well, above the troposphere, of course, is the stratosphere. And when you heat up the troposphere and the stratosphere has a you know much colder temperature, that variant, that is what causes these massive sort of changes to the jet stream and the wind shear. So it's literally you know, not that complex. It's simply more warm, more warmth is going to the sort of the air above us, the troposphere. That difference with the stratosphere is causing these canyons and these various deep wind shears that are affecting the jet stream. There used to be a time when, okay, well, we can pretty much predict weather forecasters could say, okay, based on various pressure domes, the, the jet stream is gonna be here, it's gonna be here, and they could sort of advise aircraft, be careful of where the jet stream turns over, say, Michigan or Ohio, whatever it is, there might be some problems there. Well, now the jet stream is being broken up so often and being turned around and being, not turned around, but being bent and and, and sort of ways that a lot nearly impossible now for the airline industry, for civilian aircraft, military aircraft to keep track of all the different possible trouble spots because that's how much the jet stream is changing. It's not as predictable as it was 20 or 30 years ago. And again, there's a direct correlation with climate change. Yeah, and so here's a great irony. Remember the Republicans made up that lie that if you pass a Green New Deal that they would ban all air travel? Just a lie, total utter lie, right? Well, as it turns out, the thing that's endangering air travel is not passing the Green New Deal. By the way, Americans don't disagree. A Green New Deal, when it was first introduced, in two separate polls polled over 80%. It still polls massively popular, massively popular, well over two thirds of the country. But we don't have a democracy. We have a, a Congress filled with crooks who take bribes for a living and a media who says, I see no evil, I hear no evil. Oh, The planet's burning and now the we have these pockets of turbulence that come out of nowhere and are extreme weather events that are gonna harm you like a thousand other things. Nope, let's go mine the minerals on the meteor. Let's go on and talk a little bit about, uh, speaking of crooks, let's talk about some uh, awful cops in Sacramento. The Sacramento, California City Council has just released some police body camera video of um, local police putting a 10 year old girl who was in pajamas in handcuffs. Uh, and she and they did this as she cried and sobbed. The incident from February 2022 was part of a two year audit of complaints um, that the city council asked for, complaints against the police department that they then reviewed. Uh, and it was part of this was to sort of um, was to sort of take a look at well how responsive are the police? Are they responding to complaints? Are the complaints making a difference? Well, in this particular video clip that we're going to show you in just a second here that that that, that was, was released. You had members of the local Sacramento police force, all white, who were going to an African American home. And they were looking for to do a probation check on a verified gang member. So no problem there. 
But take a look at the aggressiveness and the tone that the police used and continued to use when the gang member didn't show up, but this little girl did. Who, by the way, was bed was watching her bedridden grandmother. Here's the video. Hi, can you unlock this, please? Can you open this screen door? It's the police department. Can you open this? Hey, Sacramento Police Department, come to the door. Come to the door. Can you open this, man? Come to the door right now. Listen, we're going to kick the door down, and we don't want to do that. Come to the door right now. Open the door. I'm a baby. Open the you're door. not a baby if you're not listening. Open the door. Come outside. Come outside right now. Who is here? You're going Who is here? <laughs> no, you don't get to go and hide and turn off the lights. That's not how this works. Okay, but you're going to be the team to hate us. Because you, you're not listening. I'm scared. I'm scared. Why, why are you running and hiding? I'm scared. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. How old are you? At that point, the police officer took the handcuffs off of the sobbing girl and went from taunting and gruff to a bit more empathetic and calm. The police audit found that this handcuffing of a 10 year old girl did not violate police policy because such policy does not exist. As the Sacramento Bee reports, the city's inspector general Dwight White and CPSA director Letitia Watson showed a snippet of body camera footage during Tuesday's city council meeting eliciting tears from several members of the audience. During the video from February 10th, 2022, several white male officers can be seen screaming at people inside to open the door, grabbing the metal screen and forcibly shaking it so hard, it looks like it will fall off the hinges. The audit revealed a systemic problem of officers engaging in a pattern of unreasonable stops, searches and seizures violating community members fourth amendment rights, especially black and Latino residents. It included 109 complete complaint cases of improper search and seizure from June 2020 through June 2023. Police chief Kathy Lester said she agreed with parts of the audit which contained helpful recommendations, but disagreed with the finding that racial bias in search and seizure actions is systemic. It is worth noting that the police chief defended the officer's detainment of the girl, but the chief acknowledged that they should have detained her in another way without using handcuffs and that handcuffs were not necessary. However, the police department also points out that the handcuffs were only on for 30 seconds, they say. Well, a number of mental health experts point out that even 30 seconds of a traumatic experience like this is something that could scar this young girl for a lifetime. Uh, there are a number of cities, Jenk, across the United States that simply do not have a policy when it comes to whether or not their officers should handcuff young children. That is now something being reviewed, at least in Sacramento. Yeah. So, uh, look, uh, to double down on what uh, David said, they go out there and do a probation check. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, they're frustrated that they can't get an answer. We get it, okay? Uh, but when you see the girl and and you see how young she is, you can't have that reaction, okay? And you can't justify that reaction. So um, I got a 10 year old daughter, coincidentally. Oh My God, if cops came in and then handcuffed her just like that, yeah, she'd be a wreck. I mean, you know why? Because she's 10 years old uh, and that's super traumatic because they don't know what's going on. And, and we tell her not to answer the door to strangers. I'm sure this person was told the same thing. In fact, I think in the story they did explain that she was told that. That's why she turned off the lights because she thought it's a stranger. I'm not supposed to answer the door. I'm worried her grandmother's bedridden inside. Look, miscommunications happen, but we've got to teach cops to be decent to the citizens. That's the policy that doesn't exist. And that's what I'm most worried about. Now, is there also an issue of race? Look, I'd be surprised if they did it to my daughter. I got to be honest with you. And why? Because so my wife is Asian, so my daughter's half Asian and half whatever I am, Mediterranean or whatever. She looks fairly Asian. So I and it's we're in a middle class neighborhood. I don't. I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised. Okay, but it doesn't have to be anecdotal. You don't have to take my word for it, etc. No, they did an audit. And there's a pattern where they target blacks and Latinos. Now, why do they do that, by the way? Is it just because, oh my God, all the cops are racist? 
No, because unfortunately, demographically in this country, blacks and Latinos are not as wealthy as as whites in general, okay? And by the way, Asians. And so it's easier to target minority communities with less power. You know, we've had cops on the show who are good, honest folks uh, who retired uh, who came and said, yeah, I mean, we're not gonna go and patrol the rich white part of town because you arrest the wrong 10 year old in this case. But they said, of course, adult in that case, you arrest the wrong guy, you could be in a world of trouble. But when you target black and Latino communities, you aren't gonna be in trouble. That was the old days. Now, because some of these cameras, they are getting in trouble. And that's a good thing that should lead to reform. And reform doesn't mean no cops. And it also doesn't mean we don't change anything and we just give the cops more money. It means, God damn it, will somebody reform these police departments all across the country? Cenk, I've looked at this video and it runs you know, several minutes. It was posted by the Sacramento City Council. I've looked at it a couple different ways and we've got a video up on it on Rebel HQ. And one of the things that sort of jumps out to me every time I see this is that at the moment that the little girl sort of walks out, you have the one cop who says, you're going to jail, taunting her, like hectoring her, frightening her. And to me, it gets right in with the sort of the training point that you were mentioning. And that is police, it's almost like it's institutional. They are culturally trained, I think to dominate situations, to be a force, to not have anything, any sort of officer safety in jeopardy. And the way they do that is they are told you must take control. You must dominate, be the alpha male or the alpha female, whatever it is. The problem with that is that it doesn't allow enough time for an officer to take a step back, take a deep breath and say, "Oh my God, this is just a 10 year old girl. Hey, let's lower our voice, let's try to deescalate, let's not make people as nervous. There's no time for that because police officers are reflexively trained to go in heavy, to go in strong, to be aggressive. And that's a key part of this that when you talk to people and you talk to police about what needs to change, what's a fundamental change that needs to be done in police training, the attitude needs to change away from dominating as quickly as possible and more towards, okay, Let's all take a deep breath as we encourage children to do in schools that instead of just lashing out, if you're angry, you take a deep breath and you count to five and then react. If we could only get police officers to be trained to do that as well, I think you would see communities then start to respond better. And you wouldn't have cases like this where now you have a girl, she's 10 years old now or 12 years old, two years later. She may have a view of police that is terrible for the rest of her life and that does not help her her community, and it certainly does not help the police. And the corollary to that problem, David, is that we mainly tell the cops, take control because and do it right away because anyone can shoot you within half a second. So make sure that you're dominating, sometimes shooting, beating, etc. before the other guy gets a chance to do it. No, no, it's, a, it's supposed to be a tough job where you make judgment calls and yes, Sometimes you wait past half a second before you light into someone. Hey, oh look, it's a 10 year old, I shouldn't do it. In the case of Tamir Rice, oh look, it's a 12 year old with a toy gun, which almost all kids have. Maybe I should have waited more than a second before I shot him to death, right? But we don't teach the cops that, why? Because honestly, they're being selfish. They're saying, well, I. I'd rather take a risk with your life, whether I'm traumatizing a 10 year old or I'm killing a 12 year old, I'd rather take that risk than any risk with my life. Well, then don't be a cop, go be an accountant, Good. there's a lot of safe jobs. I mean, imagine if the fire department was like, what do you want us to do, risk our lives by going into a burning building? Yeah, that's kind of the job. So please do your job and do it with thoughtfulness and good judgment. Isn't it sound, like as I said that out loud, didn't almost all of you think, there's no chance the cops in America are gonna do that. There's something wrong with our system of government when we think there's no way in the world cops or politicians will ever do the right thing and will ever listen to the citizens. Something deeply wrong. Speaking of wrong, Jenk, um, the Pentagon and some of their contractors, um, $50,000 for a single garbage can that used to cost $300 in an aircraft. Well, now the Pentagon is overpaying. The contractors are squeezing the military. And why? Because, well, now the contracts are not as competitive as they once were. And that story's coming up.
All right, back on TYT, Jank, David, and look at all these wonderful new people. Divinely Aware, Kyle Tannenhill, M. Brown, Greg Griffin, and um, Burgundy will read anything in the prompter as long as you become a member. Eat me just joined. Uh, so <laughs> hit the join button below on YouTube and have some fun. Uh, and you can do it at tyt.com slash join as well. And every member helps us do honest reporting and try to fight for change for you guys. All right, David, what's next? Well, what's the most amount that any of you watching this program, listening would spend for a garbage can? Well, for the Pentagon, that number is apparently $50,000 because that's what they paid to a military defense contractor according to a new report from responsible statecraft. Private contractors have been jacking up the prices of simple items and the Pentagon agreed to screw over the taxpayers and shell out an extra $1.3 million for those unnecessary markups, including trash bins. Again, this comes from responsible statecraft. Until 2010, Boeing charged an average of $300 for a trash container used in the E3 Century in a surveillance and radar plane based on the 707 civilian airliner. When the 707 fell out of use in the United States, the trash can was no longer a commercial item, meaning that Boeing Boeing was not obligated to keep its price at previous levels, according to a weapons industry source. In 2020, the Pentagon paid Boeing over $200,000 for four of the trash cans, translating to roughly $51,606 per unit. In a 2021 contract, the company charged $36,640 each for 11 trash containers, resulting in a total cost of more than $400,000. The apparent overcharge cost taxpayers an extra $600,000 between the two garbage can contracts. But that's not all. There are other examples, of course, of egregious and wasteful spending. In another case, Lockheed Martin hyped the price of an electrical conduit for a P3 plane as much as 14-fold, costing the Pentagon an additional $133,000 between 2008 and 2015. Jamaica Bearings, a company that distributes parts manufactured by other firms, sold the Department of Defense 13 radio filters that had once cost 350 bucks each for nearly 49,000 per unit in 2022. The apparent markup cost taxpayers more than $600,000 in extra fees. 60 Minutes recently did an investigation highlighting the rampant price gouging in the arms industry, including one case in which Boeing overcharged taxpayers by more than half a billion dollars for missiles used in the Patriot Missile Defense System. The investigation also revealed that Raytheon Technologies had raised the price of Stinger missiles from $25,000 each to more than $400,000 per unit, even accounting for inflation and some improvements. That's a seven fold increase, according to Shea Asad, a former Pentagon acquisitions official told 60 Minutes. And these companies, by the way, of course, are making out like bandits. About half of the Biden administration's $842 billion Pentagon budget request goes to contractors. In 2022, roughly 30% of military spending went to the big five weapons makers, which include Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, and Northrop Grumman, and again, this comes from Connor Eccles, responsible statecraft. Jack, I remember it was like 30 or 40 years ago where there was something like hammers were costing the Air Force you know, several thousand dollars and that sparked all kind of outrage. But now it's just gotten exponentially more egregious. Yeah, look, uh, just because they wear suits doesn't mean they're not crooks. So these uh, guys, the defense contractors overcharging us by half a billion here, half a billion there, uh, they're complete and utter crooks. And their co-conspirators are almost all of the politicians in Congress. There are some progressives that vote no on these budgets. In fact, let's be honest, in the last Pentagon budget, there was only one person that voted no, and it was Ro Khanna. Yes, he's a progressive, and even everyone else still voted for it. And so, no, this is absolutely outrageous, there's no accountability. And the reason there's no accountability is because they literally bribe I'm sorry, campaign contributions, mainstream media, are you happy that we all pretend that they're not bribes? They're bribes, they bribe them so that they, uh, they give millions of dollars to these greasy, crooked politicians, almost all of them. They take that and then they go, "Oh my God, it is so important that we have defense. No, they should not pass audits. They should just rob us goddamn blind and give me a part of the proceeds. Oh, oops, oops. Did I say that out loud? Well, you didn't, and the media is never gonna correct you on it, but we're now part of the media, so we're correcting your ass. Let me give you more graphics here. Graphic seven, in December, the Pentagon flunked its fifth consecutive audit, unable to account for more than 
60% of its three and a half trillion dollars in total assets. So they can't find over two trillion dollars. They can't find it. They, totally unaccounted for. Not two million, not two billion, two trillion. They're like, oh, golly gee, why? Did you want the two trillion? Yeah, god damn it, I did want the two trillion. I wanted to go to paid family leave, free college. I wanted to go to a higher minimum wage. I wanted to go to things that actually help Americans. Child tax credit, it was incredibly popular. We could have spent that money on all of us. But we could have spent it on Democrats, we could have spent it on Republicans. We spent it on independents, spend it on actual Americans. Instead, a bunch of crooks stole it. Stole it, and then the politicians help them steal it, and then mainstream media comes in and does the cover up. Oh, I don't see a crime here. What? What? Oh, two trillion dollars is missing? No, that's not a problem at all. Let's talk about trans athletes in high school sports, all seven of them, because that's the major issue. Okay, I'm going to give you more. Then you get crooks like Joe Manchin, a total and utter criminal. Uh, he said he's worried though, he is worried about wasting the government, to be fair. Okay, so let's go to graphic 10. I cannot accept our economy or basically our society moving towards an entitlement mentality. Oh, I'm sorry, he didn't say that about the Defense Department or the missing trillions of dollars from the Pentagon. He said that about poor people when they were getting the child tax credit. And he's like, they shouldn't get it, they're just the average American. A bunch of people think they're entitled, they didn't even bribe me. They didn't contribute a single dollar to my yacht. He literally lives on a yacht. And all of the defense contractors bribe him 24 seven. And he doesn't mind trillions of dollars being flushed down the toilet or put into a 50 or $500,000 trash can. But God forbid that any actual American gets money. Well, then he's super mad about the entitlement complex. Last one from me, graphic 11, gives you a sense of scale of our budget. Look at the military, nearly. Nearly half of the entire budget. If you once you put in veteran benefits, it's more than half. <laughs> what do we need all that defense for? What the hell are we talking about? It's not defense. It's to go invade random countries so they can make even more money. Bunch of criminals. If you stole two trillion dollars, what do you think would happen to you? Now watch, Jake Tapper will jump in and blame me and go, you can't say they stole it, they just can't find it. <laughs> you guys are a joke. Everyone in power is a joke and they steal from us day in and day out. That's reality. Jack, at least there, there's, a, there, there's an effort by at least you know Bernie Sanders, of course, to try to make the Pentagon pay for this sort of malfeasance since he's actually gotten some support for his, uh, for his bill from Senator Chuck Grassley from Iowa. So what they've done is they've rolled out a bill that essentially would force the Pentagon not only to undergo an audit, which they do now, but actually to pass the audit. Uh, and, if, uh, and, and if this audit, um, if it's called the Audit, um, the Pentagon Act of 2023, it would force every component of the Defense Department that fails an audit in fiscal year 2024 to return 1% of its budget to the Treasury Department. Here's what Bernie Sanders said of the bill, the Pentagon and the military industrial complex have been plagued by a massive amount of waste, fraud and financial mismanagement for decades. That is absolutely unacceptable. If we're serious about spending taxpayer dollars wisely and effectively, we've got to end the absurdity of the Pentagon being the only agency in the federal government that has never passed an independent audit. And to put a fine point, Jack, on what you were saying about Joe Manchin, that he's not really concerned about Pentagon wasteful spending, but Damn, is he really concerned about social security and other social safety net programs uh, that he says he would rather take away? Here is Manchin talking about that just last November. Looking ahead, what are the similar opportunities for bipartisan action? You're gonna get your financial house in order. We cannot live with this crippling debt. If they don't get their house in order, if we don't look at the trust funds that are going bankrupt, whether it be Medicare, Medicaid, social security, highway, all the ones, Alan earned tremendous problems right now. If yep. we can't come to grips of how we face the financial challenges this country has, then we're all going to be paying a price that we can't afford. We can't afford it. And Manchin, by the way, also added, I cannot accept our economy or basically our society moving towards an entitlement mentality. 
Of course, we have an entitlement mentality with our defense contractors. That's why they are gouging us. And oh, by the way, part of the problem is they don't have competition. A lot of these contracts are no bid, so they're able to get away with jacking up the prices because nobody else is bidding on this stuff. And to put another finer point on this, Jenk, if you look at the total amount of, let's talk about how the US military spends compared to the top 10 other industrialized nations. We spend, the United States spends more on defense than the next 10 industrialized nations combined. And of course, if you're a defense contractor, you are making out like a bandit. Your stock prices are up, you're able to give stock buybacks, you're able to give bonuses. You've got executives who are making 20 to $25 million a year. And of course, because they are able to charge what they wanna charge. And there's essentially nothing that the Pentagon or at least the Department of Defense has been doing right now to put an end to this and to actually ask these contractors to, to cost the Pentagon a fair market value. Well, hopefully Bernie Sanders can get some traction behind his effort. That would at least be a start. So by the way, great job by Bernie. He's one of the very few people who's actually trying to do anything in Congress. It's a perfectly good bill. It's literally the least we can ask for. If you can't tell us where the money is, and we have no confidence where the money is going and whether you guys are just literally stealing it and putting it in your pockets, then at least give us back 1% of the budget, it has no chance of passing. Every Republican will vote against it. And then crooks like Joe Manchin who claim to care about the deficit will all of a sudden they're like 1% of the defense budget just because they're stealing it? No, no, no way, no, how will I get my bribes? My yacht has needs a new yacht within a yacht, I can't do that. What a crook Joe Manchin is. And what does mainstream media call Joe Manchin every time? Moderate. Well, if you asked, if you polled Bernie's bill, the right wing doesn't want the Pentagon, right wing voters doesn't want the Pentagon stealing from us either, and they don't want endless wars either. It would poll at about 90% of Americans. God damn it, give us at least 1% back if you can't pass an audit. Yet in Congress, it has a 0% chance, because this country is run almost exclusively by crooks. And those crooks are demanding that we crack down on the waste, fraud, and abuse in Medicare. And sure, there are various government programs. Any government program is not going to be perfect. There's no such, no such thing as perfection. But it's just, it's so amazing to me, Jenk, that you have Republicans who are so hyped up and so angry about the waste and the fraud and the abuse that exists in social security programs and Medicare. And we've got to do something about it. And yet, when you then ask them about, okay, well, let's talk about something that actually has even more waste, fraud, and abuse. And a higher dollar figure, the military, oh, no, 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 we're not gonna do that. We just let the Pentagon, we give the Pentagon the money and they do what they want. Well, that's that's a problem. And that just sort of underscores why I think so many people, it's not that we are necessarily anti-military or anti-Pentagon. It's like we don't like the fact that the Pentagon is essentially an entitlement program for people who make bombs and missiles. And yes, maybe some bombs and missiles are necessary to US national security, but it is not necessary for the taxpayers to be put on the hook for paying $50,000 for a freaking garbage can in a plane that used to cost 300 bucks. All right, uh, we gotta do the last story, uh, I, it's too amazing, let's do it. All right, Jen, this one is, uh, I'm gonna talk, call it corporate vote. The small town of Seaford, Delaware. Well, it's gained a national attention for a proposed bill that would have allowed corporations to vote in local elections. Here's an excerpt from the bill, which was introduced in April. Every owner of property in the city as of the day of final registration next preceding the annual election, whether a natural person or artificial entity, including but not limited to corporate partnerships, trusts and limited liability companies, and who is registered to vote in the book of registered voters maintained at City Hall, shall have one vote. An artificial entity shall be a domestic entity in the state of Delaware and be in good standing. The bill would have given corporations, of course, huge amounts of power. Just 340 people in Seaford voted in the most recent election on April 15th. And the bill would potentially provide as many as 234 votes to the businesses in the community. 
And oh, by the way, corporations, of course, already have a lot of privileges in Delaware. The state is one of just a few that do not charge corporations income tax and allow corporation officers to hide themselves behind a vast web of secrecy. Delaware is also home to the 200 year old Chancery Court, which presides over corporate disputes and helps give the state its pro business reputation. Its business court has been a model for 25 other states, often delivering more favorable outcomes to corporations than regular district courts would. David Genshaw, the mayor of Seaford, supported the bill. He said, these are the people we're trying to attract to our community that we're asking to invest, to hire. Why wouldn't we give them a right to vote? I find it hard to believe. <laughs> Who wouldn't want that to happen? These are folks that have fully invested in the community with money, with their time, with their sweat. We want them to have a voice if they choose to take it. Democrats control the Seaford legislature and for a while, it seemed like they might actually pass the bill. State House Speaker Peter Schwarzkopf said in a committee hearing in May that he is kind of caught in a pickle here, he said. I don't think it's a good idea, but I don't think I want to vote to stop it. Why thankfully, not? <laughs> and thankfully, the story has a happy ending for now, at least for those of us who are of the sane minds. Here's what More Perfect Union reported yesterday, breaking the Delaware House removed the Seaford LLC bill from its agenda and adjourned without a vote. A big win for democracy in the first state for now, but Delaware could go a step further and pass HB 189 to ban LLCs from voting in all local elections. Hmm. Okay. Of course, House Bill 189 was introduced by progressives and would deny all corporations and other artificial entities the right to vote. Yeah, and LLC is a corporation and in they could already vote in some elections in Delaware. That's cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. So I learned this during the Bush Cheney years when we had to study torture because they started torturing people on behalf of America. It turns out that you know you've broken a detainee that you're torturing when you can get them to admit things that they know aren't true, that are obviously not true. Then that then they're broken and they'll tell you anything that you want. And uh, and that was actually the point, Dick Cheney uh, ordered that kind of torture so they can get them to say false things about how Iraq attacked us when Iraq had not attacked us. The whole country is being tortured by our politicians and our media as they pretend these outrageous things are not outrageous. A corporation voting? Are you guys mental? What does that mean? Why the hell would a corporation vote? It's not a person. So, so, by the way, some guy in Delaware. So, remember, this is like this was to make sure that all corporations could vote in all elections. And the Democrats said, "Oh, we're in a pickle." What? Wait, why are you in a pickle? Where's the pickle? Oh, that's because you're crooks and you get donations, i.e., bribes from these same companies. They're like, "Oh man, I mean, they're they're obviously not human beings, and then voting is just nuts." But on the other hand, I'm a criminal. And I take bribes from them, so hmm, I'm in a pickle. I'm in a pickle. By the way, another guy, another politician from Delaware is Joe Biden. You know what Joe Biden's nickname used to be when he was in the Senate? There's tons of companies that register in Delaware. Credit card companies are enormous in Delaware. And in the old days, there was a credit card company called MBNA. Biden's nickname was the senator from MBNA. Because he just, he would represent credit card companies religiously. He law after bill after bill after bill to give credit card companies the ability to crush you and make sure that you can't ever get out of your debts. That's who Joe Biden is. That's how these Democrats in Delaware are who are in the pickle. How about Republicans? 100% corrupt. They're all in favor of companies being able to vote. So since some of the LLCs can already vote in Delaware, some guy who set up 31 LLCs and got to vote 31 times. One guy voting 31 times, no, it's okay. It was one human and 30 corporations. Corporations are not human beings. Anyone who tells you that, including the Supreme Court, all the crooked politicians and all the crooked media, they're lying. They're gaslighting you to the point of torture. They are not human. They have no human rights. We are their creator. We can choose whatever rights they have. To argue that they have constitutional rights like free speech, which is now interpreted as completely and utterly allowing bribery and now voting? No, 
No, I'm here to tell you, everyone else that pretends this stuff is normal is 100% lying to you and they are part of corporate rule and corporate tyranny. This is madness, they're not at all human. And all they do is bribe our politicians and buy off our governments. That's the reality, we gotta go. And I don't even understand, Cenk, no. what more do these people who support LLCs and corporations having a vote, what more do they want than what they already have? As he pointed out, thanks to the Supreme Court saying that, oh yeah, corporations can give unlimited sums of money into our political process. They can bribe, they can corrupt, they can spend as much money through PACs, whatever. Whatever a corporation wants to spend, that's fine. There's no limits for PACs. And oh, by the way, maybe there's some limits in terms of direct contributions, but a lot of corporations don't give money that way. So what is it, what else? Do these people who support corporations want? What are you gonna get from being able to vote and have a corporation vote that you don't already get through the amount of money, corporate money that is washing through the system and corrupting the process? It's just, it seems absurd to me. David, I asked the same question. It turns out there is an answer. It's because okay. they're in these small little towns in Delaware and they wanna strip the town from having the ability to regulate them at all. So it's completely mm -hmm. lawless. And in those small towns, there's so many corporations that they can outvote the citizens. Wow, so development and they can say, let's get rid of the wasteland, yeah. let's sort of build in areas, let's destroy things. Let's not worry about, I don't know, environmental dangers or hazards to our citizens. Let's do whatever we can vote for. Uh, we take our vote and we suddenly say, oh yeah, we're gonna you know build those power lines and we're gonna build that you know that power plant that may be dangerous and untested and we're gonna put you know cell phone towers and all sorts of stuff that we don't really quite know the health hazards yet. We'll put that next to a school because who cares? Because the corporations they those businesses want it as opposed to the citizens who have to live their lives there. Um, it's it's remarkable. Indeed. All right, we gotta go. Everybody check out David on Rebel Headquarters. Does. Excellent videos there, you're gonna love it. Okay, when we come back, uh, we've got more uh, fighting in politics, of course. And what happened in that submarine? Uh, we've got the news, uh, including uh, some latest developments as well. All right, we'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad free, access members only bonus content and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and I'll see you soon.